do it. So now we're up to most of the people I think are here. Um, so let's kind of kick it off. You ready to go? I'll do a, a, an intro and then kick it over to you. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So uh, everyone knows me. This is Chad, Chad Westbrook. Um, how long have we known each other? Long time. Long time. We kind of grew up together in similar areas and, um, and, and even worked for the same company. And while I stayed in software, and eventually made my way into roofing in 2017. Chad went right into roofing and worked for some great companies. Uh, I watched him build a service department from nothing. Uh, I think I don't know what you did, five million in three years in the service division. Uh, from there, went to a national company or helped them go national through a large service and sales initiative. Uh, I watched you go to a company out of Dallas and build a service organization and inside sales, outside sales, all that. But uh, just just speaking for the, the credibility, my whole goal here is to really break down the lead process, extract from you what our clients can gather, and then try to tie that into center point at the tail end of this. So I'll, I'll kick this over to you. Okay, Awesome. Uh, so yeah, I mean, going through some of my background. So again, as Will said, my name's Chad Westbrook. Um, I'm the founder of Sales Alignment. And what we're going to talk about today is really how uh, a CRM or ultimately any type of data that's going through your system can be used to help you forecast sales, uh, forecast growth, and really understand where to invest your money to get more revenue, because that's really what it comes down to is you look at salesmen or marketing or wherever it is, uh, at the end of the day, you want to increase revenue and profit into your business. But there is a method to that, uh, I'll say craziness or all kinds of different trends that are going on. And I want to unpack some of that today. I want to talk about some of the trends I think that I'm seeing in the industry, uh, some of the things that I've used in my experience to be able to help grow the companies that I've been a part of. Um, as Will mentioned, I came in on a regional side, uh, really a new construction company that had zero service and they wanted to become more stable in the new construction world as they kind of, you know, dabbled into the service side. Uh, opened up about seven locations there throughout the U.S. So again, single one, two, three trucks inside a market. I uh, had the opportunity to work for about an $80 million corporation. And that was really cool. They had 12 existing facilities. When I uh, left there, they had 18. Uh, and the national account side was doing 20 million. Uh, and a huge part of that was lead development because again, a lot of the customers they had were local and we needed to create that national footprint and really compete with some of the largest roofing contractors and organizations in the US. And that was a real cool part about it because uh, I got to compete with some of those and really see what their sales process looked like. And then the most recent one uh, was based out of Texas, uh, and that was local. That was a single metroplex or single metroplex where uh, they really just wanted to own the market and vertically scale the business. So all three had a very unique way of how they cultivated leads because every business is different. The type of client you have, how big you are, your, your coverage, all of that is a variable inside how you find the best leads. So that's kind of what I'm going to unpack today. Um, I'm going to jump through some slides here. So if anybody has any questions, Will, please uh, interrupt me, ask the questions. Let's go through it. Uh, okay. But really kind of just jumping through what you guys said. So the intro on me, uh, we're north of 73 million, but that's specifically inside repair sales. Uh, so re-roofs come from service all day long, but when we really look at the success of the groundwork, uh, it's on the repair side. So well over uh, 73 million. Uh, over 5,000 leads that have been cultivated. So we'll talk about what a lead is in a second. Uh, an SDR is a sales development rep. So I've trained over 42 sales development reps. Um, it's like calling a, a car salesman a used car salesman. That's like really mean, right? Uh, the same thing happens on telemarketing. We don't call it telemarketing anymore. It's evolved into sales development rep. Uh, so SDR. So if you hear me talk about SDR, it's kind of what that's about. Uh, well over 100,000 uh, calls made. Uh, average gross margin on a service side is 63%. So kind of see where you guys are at and finding better leads will result in higher profitability. And then the probably the coolest part of all of this is that when you find good leads, they actually turn into meetings. Uh, it's not someone ghosting you or the guy's not there or call me, email me information. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But good leads means that you guys are actually converting leads into meetings. 
So as we kind of jump through this, some background on me and, and where we're going, but the real part I think that I want to start with here is talking about the actual cost of doing business. And a lot of times this cost is swept under the rug because, well, you got to give quotes to get sales, right? But a lot of times we give quotes to companies, individuals that aren't even interested inside buying. They're, they're kicking tires. Maybe they're getting ready to sell the building and they just want to see how much of a hit they're going to take. Uh, or their other roofers said, hey, it's time to replace the roof. And then we go through as contractors this massive process of drawing up scopes of work, going out there, surveying the building, doing CAD drawings, creating this big, massive scope of work for someone that doesn't even have the money to replace the roof. So good qualified leads is really what we're going to focus on. So when we talk about cost, um, I think this picture does awesome. Uh, first off, no lead is actually free because as we start talking about touches, everything that you guys do costs money. And whether it's time, right? Time is money right there. Uh, or whether it's investment of actually sending your people out there. Doesn't matter if they're salary, we're still using their time to be able to do something or you know, create some type of quote or budget or information. So in order to really look at it, uh, this is just kind of a, a, an example breakdown. Um, what you pay per lead. So if you're paying a telemarketer or sales development rep, or let's just even say your salesman who's cold calling, that's time and money that you're paying them. Travel to be able to go out to the job, right? Because you got to start the truck up. You got to get them out there. The roof inspection itself, that's time on the roof. If your salesman's doing it, could be a little bit cheaper. But if you're sending a field expert uh, or uh, your superintendent or whatever it is, you got to pay that guy. The estimator, if the salesman or uh, guy, um, service manager is not estimating, you got to pay an estimator, especially on a rear roof. Your core cuts, as soon as you could cut the core, you got to patch it. You're using materials in that. Uh, and then even going from there, the sales meeting to be able to qualify it. And that's 1500 bucks. And the only thing that we've done so far is look at the roof and have a sales meeting. And we've already spent $1,500 approximately, right? For this lead. Now, so I think started... that, yeah, that, let me just cut in here because I think this is really interesting. And I know you've been visiting a lot of contractors and in, in, in having these discussions and analyzing it. Are these actual um, actual figures you've been able to extract out of companies of what they spend to get quotes out? Oh man, this is low. This is low. So we're talking about a, a roof inspection, right? And we all know that big building on the edge of town that calls and says, hey man, I'd like a roof inspection. And we all get happy. And we say, yeah, no problem. I'll get out there. I'll look at it because yep. this is going to be worth tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you spend a whole day on site. Right. And let's look at a technician. You're billing 90 bucks an hour. He's on site for eight hours gathering the information. This doesn't even include coming back to the office, finalizing the report, again, estimating for each one of those deficiencies. If you don't have unit pricing set up uh, a lot of variables where if you don't have a good CRM or technology to help you, um, it's only adding to this number. So fifteen hundred bucks in, in my experience is low. And we'll talk about what that looks like on the on the sales side. Heard. Awesome. So think about this, guys. Think about what your process is that takes you all the way up to delivering a bid. Because what happens, and we're going to talk about this journey, and I've been on this journey many, many times myself. So the client calls in, right? Asks for a bid and then says, you know what? Just come out, just come out. You know, my talk to the general manager, talk to the manager on duty. He's there. So you won't meet with anybody on site where you can't do a formal discovery meeting or a qualification meeting, you know, calls in, not there, do it. Um, so you say, okay, you know what? You're in town. It makes sense. I'm going to knock it out. You inspect the building and then they won't meet with you to discuss the inspection report. You call them up or you email them and just say, Hey, can I swing by the building? And all of a sudden they say, you know what? Just email it to me or let's, you know what? Well, email it to me and then we'll jump on a call afterwards. That happens all the time, right? So then he asks for the email or the proposal to be emailed. So then you email it and guess what? He goes blank. Can't get them. Can't get the time inside there. Can't get all that stuff to put together. Then your salesman is now following up with this individual. So we talk about following up. That takes time, right? So going in, putting a note inside the system, calling the guy, leaving a voicemail, and it goes dark. So then he goes through there and actually receives the proposal. Maybe he answers. 
And then you got to follow up again. What, what's going on? Are you actually going to buy this, right? Then the salesman finally gets upset and he goes by the site. And I'm telling you this because in my world, this, these were my salesmen that would not let go of a poorly qualified lead or a lead for a quote because the salesman or the client told them something that they wanted to hear. So when you take all this and you put it inside there, this is what the time looks like. Client calls in, takes 10 minutes to receive the call, put the information inside the system, create the opportunity or activity, right? Takes, goes out there, we call the client, hey, can you meet on site? No, we're not gonna be there. You inspect the building, won't meet on site. So now you gotta put together this nice, pretty email that takes you 30 minutes to be able to put up. You put the document in, put all your, uh, you know, your uh, documents and all your stuff inside there, your social proof, all that fun stuff. And if you look through this and just say, hey, can I kind of relate to this? This is 10.25 hours, okay? 10 hours. 25% of a week is wasted following up with bad leads. Leads that don't close, leads where clients don't have any interest inside buying it, all because we're happy and excited to be able to go out and quote a job. So this is what we talk about. The cost of a bad lead is time, right? And what would your salesman do with another 25% of their week if they weren't chasing bad leads? So I don't want to get too far into the, the sales side of it, but sales is huge because you can have the best lead in the world. And if you have a poor sales process or poor qualification process, your sales team will burn it or you'll waste their time trying to get them to sell the job that will never sell. So a huge part of it, understanding the cost, uh, which is really time that comes into a bad lead. So I want to talk about, first off, a touch. And this is a marketing term. And what a touch is, is basically anything that connects your prospect to your business. This can be a van that's driving down the road, a phone call that comes from a sales representative. It can be a business card on a cork board of the local bar down the street, a radio ad, uh, a piece of literature that's left on someone's desk, anything that connects your prospect with your business. And I get frustrated so much when I see white vans driving down the road because you have giant billboards who can market what you do. And when it comes to growing, especially new clients, no one is going to be overconfident with a brand new company that they never heard of that cold called them to get a meeting, right? Or your salesman stopped in and says, hey, I'm doing work right down the road. It takes time to be able to grow that confidence to where the customer trusts you to be able to A, give you money to make repairs, right? Or B, trust you enough to be able to say, hey, you know, I'd like to work with you. I'd like to continue to work with you. Making sense, Will? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, these touches too, when you kind of spread it out across the board, you're mentioning that it's multiple touches before they even talk to you or even get, you know, some form of relationship. Uh, is that something that you've measured too? Like how many touches lead towards Okay, I'll talk to you. So the, the touch is very hard uh, to be able to truly and accurately measure. Now, InsideSales.com, I think, said it was like 7 to 12 or something like that on a report that I had seen for touches. But it takes 7 to 12 touches for a customer to even be confident inside doing business with you. Because if, again, someone cold calls you, right, and shows up and says, hey, my name's Tom. I'm from, you know, Tom's HVAC and Heating. You don't know them from anybody, but when you get the company and I'm locally in Chicago here, so I'll use black diamond plumbing, which has radio ads, trucks all over all kinds of different marketing. They own the HVAC and plumbing side of, of Northwest Chicago. So I don't even have to know them. I just know of them and I'm instantly more confident because of the social proof that they have. So when you talk about touches, you know, very simple, a cold call, that's a touch a voicemail, that's a touch, a piece of literature that you leave on their desk, that's a touch, the truck they see driving down the road on their way home from work, that's a touch, uh, the business card that they see on the court board at the restaurant, whatever it might be. And social media is a great example of this because very few leads, at least inside my world, have actually came from social media. Mm -hmm. Call to action, all that stuff is great, but that's branding. Because the more they can see your logo, the more they can see your face or your name is the more comfortable they become with you being a provider within their area. So yeah. that's 
key to all of this. A touch is very hard to track because again, we can't track if they see our van driving down the road. But the fact of the matter is that van, it might live in the same neighborhood as this guy, right? And he sees it every day driving to work. And all of a sudden you have this massive social proof for this individual, but really you live in the same neighborhood and it's the only van you have. So yeah. that's the great part about marketing is you don't have to be a multi-million dollar company to have exposure on your potential prospects as long as you do it right, right? You're inside the market or the segment that your customers are in. So you keep mentioning uh, social proof, maybe elaborate on what social proof means uh, if you can. Yeah, absolutely. So social proof is something that's going to make you um, evident or have some type of, I'm searching for the right word inside this, some type of um, impact locally. So social proof can be a letter of recommendation. It can be a video referral. Um, it can be, uh, again, your truck driving down, that's all local uh, social proof that you have. But anything that shows you as an expert and connects you specifically to the industry. So I have a client that I was working with that specializes inside commercial high rises. Well, social proof with that would be marketing other social high rises, right? And using different clients as references, right? Hey, we work with uh, the Radisson Hotel right down the street. That would be a social proof to say we are an expert inside what we do. Yeah, and I think that's a fair point too. In, in, in the social media side, that's really, you know, your, your Facebook, your LinkedIn, your Twitter, whatever you're using there, having those connections and pushing that out into the market space it, it, and not so much showing past jobs in your example, it's showing who, who they work with, right? And that would be more of a social proof. Absolutely. Absolutely. Being able to show that you are an expert inside your, your world or whatever your specific niche is. And then being able to expand on that, that we've solved this problem for someone else and we can solve it for you. Mm. So that's social proof to be able to show that you can, uh, you can execute on that. So a, a touch is a huge part of marketing because yes, it's hard to track, but how you expose yourself to your potential prospects. So again, LinkedIn uh, is great because it's a business to business. And like most of us here, we are B2B uh, contractors, right? Uh, that's where you want to be. You want to be inside that professional network. Now, if you're B2C on a residential side, Facebook might be better for you. So figuring out where your clients are, uh, IFMA, BOMA, again, uh, big words and, and big associations. Uh, but again, finding out where your clients are and then being there when you need to be there, having the marketing uh, or whatever exposure you can have to those uh, individuals is huge. So the next thing I want to talk about is lead source and lead source is an extension of a touch because you can touch a client multiple times. Again, they see you on Facebook, see your truck driving down, all that kind of different stuff, all leads to the confidence that they have in doing business or engaging you. The lead source is the channel that they took to get to you. So when I say lead source, what I mean is they picked up the phone and they called you they hit the send message on Facebook. They sent an email to you based upon uh, a business card they got, right? It's whatever channel or process or path that they take to get to you. And that is trackable. So every time that a client comes into your business, every time you get an opportunity to do business, something that we all should be doing is asking, how did you hear about us? Because that's going to take you deeper into the lead source. The lead source that came in is maybe they picked up the phone but if we were to say, hey, how, can I ask, how do you guys hear about us? And they're like, you know what? I saw the truck driving down the road and I saw the number on the side and I called it. That can take you deeper into the lead source side and understand what touches are actually having an impact on your business. Does that make sense, Will? Yeah, perfect sense. And it's good to kind of tie it all the way back to the beginning. Lead sources um, in terms of how the client came to you or is that per job or both? This is per opportunity. So yes, you can have your overarching, how did we get this big company, right? How do we get uh, uh, Morrison Supply, whatever it is, right? How do we get that? Well, we got it because a telemarketer called it. That's great. But also understanding how the customer, the branches, the, the sites are coming back to you is very important as well. Because if you can see, okay, they called us for a leak here. They responded to one of our marketing emails here. 
tracking every opportunity on what the lead source is is really important because that'll help you understand again the channels on how they get to you and that'll that'll help you understand i mean i got clients that i can literally text message with right they're going to send me a text message and be like hey leak at 143 that is a lead source that's a channel on how they get to you is text message uh something that's that's growing a lot so being able to understand that that is a lead source for you guys is text message marketing uh can be the difference from being a commodity to being easy to work with yeah it, it's so true i met with a, a company that does um lead gen and they they're really good at what they do and i asked them like what are your conversions like do you, you just have a call center you know that's how it used to be you used to have call centers everyone had call centers mm -hmm. and they said that 60 plus percent of their appointments come from text messaging uh, so. i i absolutely believe it um the amount and text messages is very quickly becoming more uh, popular. I can't tell you how many text messages I got yesterday for the whole voting thing, right? Everybody somehow got my number. I'd love to know how they got it, but <laughs> it's really happening. And the great part about text messages is that like 100% of it gets read, right? Because in order to mark it as read, you literally have to open it or slide it. Um, and it's instant response. It's a different channel. Everybody gets a hundred plus emails and that's where spam and junk come into play where you're just kind of skimmed over. So if you can find a unique lead source uh, that can help your marketing, uh, that that's fabulous. And text messages is absolutely there. No question. So when we talk about lead source, what I'm talking about is the channel that the client uses to be able to engage your company. And if you understand what the lead source is, that's how you can accurately and more efficiently invest money into your business, right? Add more fuel to the business because if you have lead sources that are low cost and high converting, that's where you want to put your business. That's where you want to put your money and your investment. So when we look at lead sources, these are a lot of the typical lead sources that I see within, let's just say the commercial side, commercial roofing side. Number one is cold call. So there's a big difference between cold call and telemarketing. Cold call is when your sales rep is making calls. OK, your sales rep is making outbound calls. Telemarketing is a specific effort that you guys are prospecting in a certain region. And that's all they're doing. So your sales rep is making cold calls and SDR is telemarketing. So specifically phone call outbound lead generation. Sales drops. Uh, I have a three to one ratio for a lot of the different companies I work with, which means for every one meeting, that your sales rep goes on, he does three drops, building to the left, building to the right, building across the street. There is massive social proof in that when you go into a building and you say, hey, I'm doing an inspection for Jim next door tomorrow you know, afternoon. Do you, do you guys have anything going on? That's a great example of social proof. So your sales drops, referrals, right? It, everybody has something bad to say when they're upset. Very few people take advantage of referrals. Email blasts, SEO is obviously a trend at this point right now, trade shows, um, every company has a unique lead source that works for them. These are just some of the typical ones that I see within the industry. So when we talk about all of this stuff coming in, the data that we have coming in, a lot of times, especially if you guys are using CenterPoint, you're already tracking some of this stuff and it's happening automatically just from you guys putting leads in. But the big part that we got to focus on is how do we use that data to help grow our business? How do we use it to help scale the business? Because the one thing that'll constantly happen, oh, sorry, going the wrong way inside there, is that we're not tracking it. And if we're not tracking it, we can't manage it. Because when we start managing that data and understanding where leads are coming from. We go to a trade show. This is a real world experience that we had. Uh, I started with a new company. We went to a trade show. Uh, we spent thousands of dollars buying this booth, getting people there, the marketing material, all of this kind of different stuff. And once we were done, I said, hey, what, what happened with the trade show? Where's all the leads at? Oh, they're, they're in business cards. Okay. Where are all the business cards at? Oh, I gave them to the sales reps. Okay, so now I go to my sales reps and I was like, hey guys, how many leads did you get from there? And they're like, ah, I, I don't know. I got a stack of business cards at home. I'm just going through them. That is, it was the most scariest thing for me because we spent thousands of dollars to be able to get to this trade show, to leave the trade show and have no accurate way of tracking what the conversion rate of that trade show is. 
So I, I'm blindly throwing money into this trade show, not knowing what the ROI is, because if they get a lead and they don't track it back to trade show, then I don't know what my ROI was. I don't know what my return on my investment for doing that trade show is. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I've been there too and, and did show after show um, and it was always disorganized. So kind of what we had to do is come up with a program that said, all right, I'm just going to manage all the leads. They go here and they'll be distributed. And if you can control the input where it starts off in center point, it starts off in your CRM and then ventures down down the path because you're right your your, your rep's going to come in and, and they're going to make a sale somewhere else and and that's not going to be tracked back absolutely absolutely so getting into that understanding what lead sources you have and then the best part of this is when you start to track it on a monthly basis so you come in and you say okay uh january february march april may and you start tracking on a monthly basis for the leads that you need one of the easiest lead sources that you guys have that's already happening is your technicians on the roof. So in center point, it's called a site bid, right? So 90% of the battle that your salesman has is getting on the roof to inspect it. He's trying to find customers that have problems so he can simply just get on the roof and inspect it. And the fact is, is that your technicians are on roofs every single day. So being able to understand that one should equal two. One job should equal two opportunities, which is the opportunity you're on right now to bill, and it should result inside a second one that's going to allow you to be able to sell a recommendation. So those are the types of lead sources that are low cost and high converting. Uh, those site bids, I have tons of proof that they convert at over 50%. So over 50% of the leads that your technicians bring back actually convert with a typical service salesman somewhere around the 35 to 40, 40%. So when we look at the data, truly understanding how many leads we need uh, in a week, how many leads we need inside a month or even a quarter, because those leads are gonna turn into opportunities. The opportunities are gonna turn into sales. So that's how we truly track the business, is understanding what those conversion rates are, which I'll jump through inside one sec, and understanding what those lead sources are. Any questions from anyone yet? Yeah, let's pause and, and let me just check the panel uh, real quick. And uh, one of them was basically, do you suggest we go back and analyze cost of past leads? And if so, where would you start? Interesting. Um, Data is only as good as how accurate it is. So we'll talk about garbage in, garbage out. So if you have good data that you can go back in and you can see where your lead source is coming from, absolutely. Um, that can be the difference on spending a good dollar or a bad dollar tomorrow. So yeah, if you can go back and get that data, absolutely. Uh, but if the data is poor and it doesn't have, again, the lead source uh, or whatever else you might be missing from that, uh, it could be more hassle than it's worth. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um... Other was, I don't know if I understand this, maybe you do. What are the touches in terms of data entry where uh, like quoted date, next action, workflow? I think what, they're asking, uh, like, what are the touch, like what are the most critical components? Like, all right, lead came in on this date, then what, then what, then we quoted it. Okay, so, so we're talking about workflow. Um, so when the lead comes in, the touches have already occurred because you guys now have the opportunity to be able to do business. So touches, again, is anything that connects your prospect to your business. So again, a truck driving down the road, a radio ad, a sales flyer on his desk. Uh, it can be anything that connects, again, your, your prospect to your business. So once that happens, that is the confidence that your customer typically requires to do business with you or even engage you. Because what everybody is afraid of, and if you ever have tried to do business with someone and got turned down, they say, I'm with a roofer, I'm okay. The reason that you get that answer is because the risk is so high for that individual to try somebody else that they're scared to do it. Because if they switch to you, even though you promise that you're the best in the world and you fail, you have just made their world harder. Because even though their service might really be poor right now, they're afraid that it's gonna be worse. 
So as you get those touches and those social proof, right, of that, we do this, we're great at this, we're a high rise expert, we know exactly what to do, right? You bring all that social proof into it, that's what's going to help you guys be more of an expert and scale into those companies that you normally can't get into. Yeah, fair point. So hopefully I answered that question, right? Yep, yep. And we are good. Uh, the rest are just curious of what it looks like. Um, and, and I know you've got some slides. I think you got some slides showing like what reports that you look for. Yeah. Um, but at the end of this, maybe we can even go into the system and, and I'll ask you some questions on like what you're the sales manager. What are you looking for? Absolutely. So having that report so you have a pulse on the business is insanely important because you can go crazy trying to track the data. Um, and as a sales leader, owner, whatever it is, uh, that's not the best spot for you guys. You guys need real accurate measurements. So you can look at the business and instantly say, okay, if we don't have enough leads today, it means we're not going to have enough quotes next week. If we don't have enough quotes next week, it means we're not going to have enough sales next month. Right. So it all flows together, but you got to have those accurate reports to be able to help you guys see it. So I know I talked a little bit about this, but this comes back to the sales team and making sure that you have a unified vision on what your company is trying to achieve. And I say that because so many times I see a sales rep told to do something without any reason why. And what happens is they see it as another task that they have to complete, another form that they have to fill out, another cell they have to select. And it just becomes, man, it's another, this sucks. And I feel for them on a way, but you can fix this as an owner or a leader by simply just explaining why, right? We want to get you guys better leads. In order for us to get better leads, we have to understand what our best lead sources are. So if you guys want better leads, you guys have to help us understand what's happening with the current ones that we have. And I say garbage in, garbage out. Because if you put garbage in the system, the reports that you're gonna get out are garbage. Good data in can even at some points give you okay reports coming out. So you wanna have the most accurate information possible going into the system. And this is hard sometimes when you're talking about sales reps, especially window warriors that are all day inside the truck driving around but try to explain to your team why you're doing this, why you're investing on the front side of the business for leads, simply so they can spend more time selling and less time trying to qualify or chase down people or are, are answering. Well, so that's garbage, the, garbage out. That's the truth is you're really, you know, it's, 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 you're helping them. If you can help them be more successful, that helps you and your company and just all around. So totally with it. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so we talked a little bit about this. So I put these screenshots in. Uh, but the technology can be a blessing or a curse, and it goes right back into garbage in, garbage out. Anytime that me, and we can dive directly into this, but we look at the screen on the right here, uh, this is ultimately the opportunities tab from CenterPoint. And when I see that lead type that's circled in green there that's blank, like that is a nightmare to me because we have an opportunity that's in the business and we have no idea where it came from. And if we have no idea where it came from, I have no idea to be able to track why, how it got there, or be able to understand, again, the front side of the lead development. And yes, it's only two out of this entire page, uh, but that is a continued problem that if we don't have the habit of always putting that in there. Um, another great point is all this is customizable. So if you get a new lead source, you got a whole different, you know, they called us because of whatever, you know, whatever the lead source is, you can add it in. So as a sales manager or even a leader, add a different lead source in. It's okay to have five, six, seven, eight lead sources if they're truly bringing leads in because that might be an area of the business that you need to look at. Um, and from a sales side, the screen on the left, it's as simple as lead type. It's just a drop down. Um, I love CenterPoint for that fact that it's literally just a drop down to be able to put what the lead source is. And then everything from a leadership side is really easy to be able to pull from it. So if you saw this screen and there were two leads that were empty, what were you doing to get it filled out? On call. Uh, it, now this is a little bit unique because it's service crew one was the manager. Okay, so let's I, say it's a salesman. I, I, I get it. Yeah, so it's a salesman. I'm calling that salesman. I'm oh. calling that salesman. I'm saying, hey, what's going on with this? He's gonna be like, oh man, that came from da 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 da. All right, put it in. Put it in right okay. now. Uh, you got to create that habit with it because whatever you tolerate will become the standard of every other employee. 
Because if one person doesn't do it, then well, guess what? I don't have to do it. And Jim doesn't put that in, so I don't put that in. And as you bring new people into the business, that again becomes your standard. So what you tolerate will become the standard of what everyone will do. So a huge part, uh, I, I know it's extreme inside this, but lead type is insanely important if you wanna scale your business. Otherwise, you're gonna be throwing cash at areas that are not proven. So tech can be a blessing or a curse, depending on what you're getting from it. Um, so the big part, I think you asked this question a little bit ago, ratios, right? Mm -hmm. So there are three critical, critical ratios that you guys need to focus on on your business. So again, a lead is the initial start of being able to create an opportunity. So a lead is not necessarily an opportunity, and this is a terminology side. An opportunity to me is quoted, sold, or dead. A lead is not there yet. It still has some qualification to go through before there's truly a monetary amount that's connected to it. So when you have a lead, the one thing you wanna make sure that it happens is that it turns into a meeting. Because once someone calls in and says, yeah, I'd like an inspection on my building, da, 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 a salesman needs to be able to go inside there and again, provide social proof, qualify or disqualify the client and make sure that they're a plausible opportunity for your business to go after. I know this was a mouthful there, but ultimately you want the lead to turn into a meeting. And there is a lot of fallout that you guys might not even notice. So client wasn't there, client canceled the meeting, client said, inspect the building uh, before we, you know, just inspect the building and give me a report. Like the example I used, that happens all the time. And the only thing that you're doing is deviating from an actual sales process. Because if you don't meet with the client or the client doesn't have the interest to meet with you, the sales or close probability of that is already lower than someone who's like, yeah, I'll meet you on site. And then all of a sudden you find out what's really going on with the business. So number one, lead to meeting ratio. So you say you have 10 leads, eight of them turned into a meeting. It means 80% of your leads actually convert into a meeting. Number two is your meeting to quote. So once you do the meeting and you confirm that the client or prospect is truly a viable individual you want to work with, well, then it's about getting it to a quote. It's about going out on the roof. It's about inspecting what's going on and getting that meeting to a quote. Now, you might think, all right, my fallout zero, uh, but that's not necessarily true because sometimes you go into a client and you look at what they have and you say, you know what? I inspected the building and this is an HVAC issue. This is a window or wall issue. This is some other trade that we don't do and it never turns into a quote. It's important to know that because again, that's a fallout. Because if all the leads that you're getting from, uh, I'm just making this up, from this magazine ad that you're doing, uh, you're getting tons and tons of leads that are coming in the business, right? But they're all residential and you guys are commercial. Well, that lead source is no good. You're investing all this money and you're getting the wrong leads. Does that make sense, Will? Yeah, so, so these need to be progressing. And if they're not progressing, we need to figure out why. And then that goes back to the very beginning. There's a, a question, you may have kind of answered it, but you know, uh, with telemarketing, it seems like the majority of the people that you uh, go out and pursue or you connect with, they're not the decision maker. So how do you convert that into getting into touch with the decision maker? So it depends really on what the company is, because there's been many times where you call an owner occupied building and the owner picks the phone up, right? Because it's a distribution center and he has five people who work there and he just happened to answer the phone because he was walking by. So you have those situations, you have other situations where uh, it's handled regionally. You can call in and no matter what, if there's a leak, that individual is going to go to a regional side. Uh, you have boards, right? You get into some of the government or the school sides, and then you have boards who make decisions. So the real thing that you want to focus on is, are you responsible for the roof? If there was a, uh, this is one of the biggest questions that you have. So when making cold calls, if there was a roof leak, who would you call? Mm -hmm. Now, if he says, I would call a roofer, you got the right guy, right? If he says, I would call my boss, you know, you don't got the right guy. So it's really just breaking it down super simple. If there's a roof leak in your building, who would you call? Who would take care of that? Oh, that would be me. I call the roofer. Okay, well, cool. How, how do you choose a roofer? How do you, how do you create that partnership? And the scripts aren't that crazy once you get them, um, but it's just the point of being able to connect with those individuals. Does that yeah. help? Does, does it kind of answer the question? Yeah, it paints, picture, it paints a, a clear picture around it. 
Uh, there's, there's no silver bullet to go to this person uh, or when you're telemarketing, what works here? Um, there's even a lot of people of influence, right? Um, there could be a, a MOD, uh, which is a manager on duty. And the manager can have a massive influence on who they use and don't use because they've had a horrible experience with one contractor. And all of a sudden they don't use this contractor at this site because this manager doesn't like it. So there's a lot of variables when it comes to lead development, uh, especially on the calling side. Love it. Um, yeah, I think we hit them all so far. Yeah. They'll pop. I'll keep monitoring that. Cool. So we talked to, so the ratios, number one leads to meetings, right? So the call comes in or the lead comes in, however it is, does it actually turn into a meeting that your sales rep runs? That's ratio number one. Ratio number two is does that meeting turn into a quote? So do you actually deliver that proposal and turn into a quote? Now, again, you got all kinds of different variables. It's a shingle roof. Uh, it's residential, it's a wall issue, it's a window issue, whatever might happen where it's not a product or a service that you provide, those would be your dropouts on the meetings to quotes. And then number three, quotes to sale. So that's your close ratio. And a lot of people always track that one, right? How many jobs do you quote to how many sell? You quote 10 jobs, you sell five, you got a 50% close ratio. So that's the one that always, everyone always pays attention to. But the two beyond that or the two before that, are actually the one that costs you the most money. And mm. that is getting the wrong leads, running the wrong meetings, and then ultimately, you know, spraying and, and praying, right? Going out there, delivering a proposal, hoping that the client's going to sell, where on a good lead development side, you're disqualifying and making sure that you don't even get to the quote side if the client doesn't match what your primary service is. Yeah. Now I know you spent a lot of time on the front end of really qualifying a lead and you'd rather invest the time up front to, to, before you invest any more time to, to actually go out and look at the building. Maybe just tell us a little bit about like what that process was when you were qualifying a lead and what you would do. Okay. So, you know, I'll, I'll start with the big picture thought on my side. My salesmen, uh, when I had them out there, they were there to cultivate, maintain, or grow relationships. And anytime that they weren't doing those three things, they ultimately weren't in increasing revenue or ultimately making the company money. If they're making cold calls, it means that they're not quoting jobs, right? Uh, if they're making cold calls, it means they're not selling jobs. So there was three main things that I always looked at. Sales, quotes, and leads. And those were the three things every single week that I would track. What sales did you make? That was a dollar amount. So if they needed to sell on service, let's just say $500,000 a year. Uh, well, it's simple. It's $10,000. You need to sell $10,000 a week. We'd work backwards on that and figure out what their close ratio was, which is number three on here. How many quotes to sales? If they had a 50% close ratio, and their average sale was $5,000, it means that they need to sell two jobs to hit their sales goal, right? So if they need to sell two jobs and their close ratio was 50%, it means they needed to quote four jobs. Follow me on this? Yep. They got to quote four jobs. Well, what was the lead to meeting ratio? And once we figure out that, we know how many leads they need. So this all goes back into it. And the lead can come from a technician. It can come from a billboard. It can come from a radio ad. Whatever it is, it doesn't make a difference. But they had to have so many leads going into their book of business every week to be able to get out so many quotes, to be able to get so much in sales. And it's actually crazy how accurate the number is. If you take a big enough span, you can't take this span inside, let's say, one week, one month, or even three months. It doesn't make sense. But if you take it over, let's just say, a 12-month period, it's insanely accurate how that close rate and all those ratios will help your salesman be successful. Because if you truly know those three metrics, leads, quotes, and sales, you can very easily have a pulse on the business, right? Because if you don't have any leads, much like I said earlier, if you don't have any leads, it means your quotes are going to be weak. And if you don't have any quotes, it means your sales are going to be weak. There are other metrics that can go into this, which is like your average close date or close range, which is how long the sale takes you to happen. Bigger sales, re ups we all know can take us three to six months sometimes to sell. Well, if you don't, if you don't quote anything in November, well, December, January, February, March, it's going to be slow. 
because you got to be quoting in November to be able to fill the pipeline of six months of the typical you know buy range. I know yeah. I'm talking a lot on sales on this, and I apologize, guys, but this all feeds into sales because sales is is obviously the engine of the business, but leads that's the fuel. The better fuel you put in is the more efficient and the better your sales reps are going to be at bringing that revenue in. Well, I think they like the sales discussion because that seems to be most of the questions that we have. Um, but I'll have I'll, two two things. One, you know, you're right. You have to have a time span, a long time span, like a year to actually report on the data to figure out what your close rates are. You can't do it over last week or last month, but could you do it over six months? Has that ever been accurate? Yeah, I think I think any data is better than no data. Um, just be aware that the shorter the time frame is, the more uh, room for variables you have, right? Uh, and I always do this, you know, a salesman tells me he's a $2 million salesman. I asked what his biggest sale was last year. He tells me a million dollars. Well, he, to me, he's not a $2 million salesman, right? He had one white elephant that was a million dollars and then he sold a million dollars inside other services. Mm -hmm. So you have room for those variables, uh, depending on how you're tracking it and what your date range is. Um, all of a sudden you got 12 inches of rain inside Atlanta. Well, guess what? That's, that's a month that you can't necessarily forecast your numbers on because it was a, a record rainfall, right? Uh, you just gotta be aware of variables like that that could skew the numbers a little bit when you have shorter time frames. Understood, and, and we know, let's say we know how many leads we need to generate X. That's what Centimark does extraordinarily well as uh, they just reverse into what each of their sales rep needs to be able to do on a weekly basis and they manage it really well. But if you don't have leads coming in, what are we doing to get leads? You know, it can't all just be coming from marketing. So therefore we have to do what? 100%. Uh, and that's a great question to be able to ask your sales rep, even right now, what's going on? How are you getting leads? What are you doing that's not being in the meanest way here, spoon fed to you? Because it's one thing for marketing just to be able to start handing stuff over, telemarketing to start handing stuff over. But what is that sales rep doing? Uh, and I'm going to jump through a little bit here, but go back to your typical lead sources. Um, if he's not, if he's not working on selling something today, if he doesn't close a contract and he doesn't quote a job, well, it looks like that he's got eight hours of cold calls, right? We all got 40 hours inside the week. Now, if he spends his eight hours a day closing jobs, well, that's amazing, right? But if he spends four hours in a, you know, closing a job, then another four hours should be quoting, delivering proposals. And if it's not delivering proposals, it's, it's cultivating. So you can, do sale, you can do cold calls, he can do sales drops right next to where jobs are happening. He can call his clients and say, hey, looking for a referral. Um, you can do all kinds of different stuff. He can go on social media, he can start adding people on LinkedIn. There are a million different lead sources that he could do to be able to get more leads coming into his book of business. So a big part of this is figuring out again, what's that, that ratio that lead to meeting ratio, because you can say, you know what, man, when you do sales drops, 50% of the sales drops that you get turn into a sale, but only 10% of cold calls you do turn into a sale. So I'm going to recommend sales drops all day long, yeah. right? Because that's the highest conversion. Then you can help your salesman be successful versus just, you know, telling them, hey, go do this, go do this, go do this, and, and hope for success. Uh, this is where you actually got proven data to show you the success. Now, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of drops, and maybe we could just talk a little bit about that. And there's another question before I, so, oh, yeah, I'll ask that in a little bit. But doing drops, and I guess in your in your success of drops, what's worked for you and your sales reps? Oh, man. Um, the, 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 uh, again, I talk about social proof a lot here, but it's a huge part of it. Um, the, the drops is insanely good because one, you instantly get face-to-face -face time with the potential buyer or decision maker. Uh, two, you're there right there. I can't tell you how many times I've been, uh, not with sales reps, but they've worked for me or whatever it might be, where they show up and I say, yeah, we do have a lead. Come out here and take a look at it. Hmm. And they take a walk out into the bay. All of a sudden they're there and there's a roof ladder. And depending if you got an awesome sales rep, right? He climbs the roof ladder, gets up on the roof and literally creates a proposal and sells it right there. That is perfect world scenario. Um, I can tell you less perfect scenario is I used to have one salesman that would video uh, FaceTime the service manager when he's up on the roof and he would literally say, hey, it's coming around this curb. I got my probe and I found this here. And then they would create a proposal off a FaceTime video. 
Uh, and then worst case scenario, he takes a bunch of photos, uh, he brings it back to the shop, uh, and whoever goes out there and inspects it just has a hundred times better understanding of what he's going out there for. So I'm with you, man. Sales drops all day long. Um, uh, window warriors are the worst thing inside the world. And I say that, uh, you know, kind of bluntly, but so be it. Anytime you're behind the window, uh, yeah, you can make phone calls and stuff like that. But if you're in an area, canvas the area. The one question I always ask every contractor I work with is if there, if there was a massive rainstorm within five miles of your office, how many leak calls do you get? Who's calling another roofing contractor to come inside your industrial park to make repairs? The, yeah. the, the coverage of that is always horrible. Always horrible. It's like, ah, you know, we've done work for him and we've done work for him, uh, but they don't own that area. The best work that you guys will ever do is the work right next door because it's either the first or last job. There's zero travel to it. And you guys can probably carry the ladder from your office over there. So, and it's the cheapest, right? It's the cheapest for the client because he doesn't have to pay travel or anything else. So those types of different things, and I'm getting into service now, um, but those are the types of things that just create this awesome sales customer relationship where you can just provide this service that can never be matched. Um, with the talk track, I mean, you know, for, for me, it was always trying to make it the simple message as, as simple as it could be. And then having these reps be able to articulate that message while they're doing drops, get contacts and then set it up in the system. So you had a next action, always had a next action, but for your reps in your experience, what were they saying when they knocked on that door, when they got inside that building? Um, so the coolest thing I ever did was I created, so a couple different things. Yes, there's te technology that can help with this, but very rarely does a customer feel special when you whip out an iPad or start looking at your phone when you're having a conversation with them. Um, what is socially acceptable is a pad of paper. So what I actually did is I created a, uh, a talk track um, that was ultimately like a watermark on my piece of paper where the technician or salesman can go in there and all the questions that he wants to ask are outlined on this piece of paper in a watermark. So it looks like the salesman is just writing down notes, but really he's following the entire script of exactly what needs to be said. And then he simply just takes a picture of that and then uploads the notes right in the center point. That was by far the most efficient way that I've gotten consistency from all of my sales reps. It's a really good idea. I like that a lot. Um, all right, a question here. I know how I would answer it, but let's hear what you would say. Should you ask uh, if the person you are meeting with wants to join you on the roof during the inspection so they can see what you see? Many people don't seem to want to go on the roof. They're either scared or they don't have a clue what they're looking at. Interesting. Okay, so I'm interested how you would answer this. So here's how I would answer it. Um, the, 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 the buyer right now that is sitting inside a seat that is is buying roofing you're right uh it's a lot more white collar uh every now and then you'll have someone who's who's in the ruts who's dirty who has no problem getting up on the roof they go up there themselves but most people don't go up on the roof because of those same exact reasons and any technology field technology is geared for one reason and it's to bring the roof to the customer so if the customer wants to meet and go on the roof absolutely because there's a huge educational piece that you can bring to it on what your social proof is, what your expertise is, what you're seeing, and he can get very confident inside using you as a contractor. However, if they don't wanna meet on site uh, or they don't wanna walk the roof, not meet on site, but if they don't want to uh, walk the roof, it's not a bad thing because the technology and the reporting that you have can literally bring the entire roof to their desktop. So I think both sides are good. Uh, but if you're going to meet with the client on the roof, I think there's some amazing value that can be added. Um, and I say this in the most open way because you can look at repairs made by other contractors. You can make comments on preventative maintenance, um, all kinds of different stuff where you can say, oh, man, look at that drain. Yeah, you can see where this is ponding all right here. You can see water's just sitting right here. And there's three ways that people learn for the most part, see, feel, or hear, right? Uh, smell obviously is, is another one, but that doesn't apply too much inside roofing, but they got to see it, right? So I've had clients um, or sales reps when they do a core cut or something like that, they'll literally take that piece of membrane and bring it down 
and they'll show the client and say, this is your roof. And they start feeling it. And they're like, wow. Right. So that's the feel side of it. See it. They got to bring the photos, do a great job, but seeing it themselves um, and then hear it. And that's you talking. So every client learns differently, uh, but you got to make sure as a sales rep, you have all three of those things together. See, feel and hear. Yeah. Yeah. No what question. I think it has its time and its place. And, and honestly, you know, I, I'd prefer to do the investigation and get my facts before I'm involving someone that's going to shadow me as I'm walking through the roof. Right. And, and again, it depends on who it is. If it's a decision maker, I'd say, you know what, um, let me just get 30 minutes of your time, 20 minutes of your time when I'm done, I'll bring this down to you and review it before I even leave. Uh, maintenance guys, they'll go up. No problem. And, and I think there's every bit of room for education anytime you can get it and, and i think that's often what wins over sales and relationships is through educating you know our, our buyers our, our customers so that would be kind of how i would answer it and if you know things could be said that are wrong or put you in a bad position too you know i've had service guys go out and you know they're bad mouthing repairs that the company made right and and that doesn't put you in a good position so be aware of who's who's there and 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 just being mindful of what's said, I guess. I want to be ready before I bring it to the customer. I absolutely agree. And I've been there with like, oh man, that's not a good repair. And the client's like, you just made that. It's like, all right, cool. We'll yeah, yeah, it. great. We'll fix it. <laughs> okay. Awesome. All right. So so we went through typical lead sources. Uh, we talked about tracking data. We talked about having good solid reports. So knowing uh, where your leads are coming from and when, because obviously your business ramps up at certain times of the year. Uh, us on the northern half of the U.S. And, and north obviously have snow and everything that play a big factor into you know our December, January, February, uh, and knowing when those leads are coming in and when you guys have to perform is key. So just like you have a pro forma for the business, you have a pro forma for the lead development side to make sure that, again, the fuel that's going into the engine is set up. Garbage in, garbage out. This is big for your sales reps. Make sure they understand the why. It's not just that they have to put a lead source in, but they need to understand the why. That way they understand and are in it to know that the information that they're putting in is only going to get them better leads, uh, more accurate closing, all that kind of data that they need to be better themselves. So teamwork on all that. Uh, blessing or a curse, uh, know your ratio. So again, just jumping through this, leads to meetings is number one. Meetings to quotes is number two, and the most commonly tracked quotes to sales, which is ultimately your close ratio. Um, there are two ways to track this uh, by dollar amount or by quantity. My recommendation is always going to be by quantity. Uh, dollar amounts can skew it, especially if you have some big contracts that come through. Uh, it can skew your, uh, your average sales rate based upon dollar. So two ways to track that. Um, so, any other? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So let's do this. You tell us Tell us what you do and, and really what um, what you're doing these days. And then I'm going to get center point open and on the background and we'll ask some questions about reports specifically. Sounds good. I do service. That's what I do. I live service. So uh, lead development, service side. So what we're here to talk about is make leads work. And ultimately what this is, is a program that allows us to be able, allows you guys to be able to create a customized program specifically based upon your guys' lead sources. So it's not, nothing is cookie cutter. You can't say, you know what, this works for you. So this is going to work for you because every town, every city, everything's different on how they interact or even the type of client you're going after. If you're inside school districts, it's going to be completely different than if you're inside cold storage. So what we do is we help you understand your data. We help you set up dashboards and then specifically put together a plan that allows you to be able to execute on, again, on the highest converting, lowest cost lead sources. I think that's probably the easiest way to be able to say it. So three types of people inside a business, you have coaches, you have consultants, uh, and, and you have uh, mentors. Consultants typically tell you what to do, right? They'll give you the business plan. Here you go. Um, your coaches think about this inside like football. They're going to help you. They're going to be on the field with you. They're going to say, run to me, turn left. That's someone who's on the field with you. And then a mentor is there to be able to challenge you. You know, they've seen it before. They're going to challenge your thinking and make you grow past where you're at. And all three of them are absolutely influential in the business. But where my company sits is a lot more on that mentor and coaching side than the consulting side. So we come in, we're in the business with you. We're helping you manage it and grow it. 
based upon what's specific to, to you guys. Um, we got three programs. So basically it's scaled to anywhere where you guys wanna go. So if you don't have anything, we have a build it program, which basically is ground up. If you have an existing one, that's great. We have a boost it program, which is just that. I have an existing team inside place, but I really gotta put some good fuel to be able to boost this. And then the get it done side is ultimately where we come in and we kind of lead the initiative. We help build it for you. Uh, and then we got the resources to be able to lead that initiative and really just start funneling leads into the business. So as a whole, uh, I know we can jump into this, but we went through a lot of the different questions. Um, I'll leave this up on the screen. So there's two different QRs that you guys can do with your phone. Uh, the first one up there, you see it can lead you directly to make leads work. So it's that simple, just makeleadswork.com or you can scan the QR. Uh, the second one is my contact information. So I figured rather than putting a phone number and an email on the screen, I'd make it easy. Uh, take your phone, scan it. It'll automatically add my contact directly into your book. Um, shoot me an email, call. Uh, if you're on Make Leads Work, there's a bunch of different stuff to schedule time with me. So. Awesome. Yeah. I've had a lot of people reach out to, and, and, you know, we do as much as we can here at CenterPoint to help our customers, you know, be successful with their businesses. And, and a lot of us go above and beyond in, in different ways. I've had a lot of people call Chad and just pick his brain and and you don't have to do anything, but just to have a conversation. And if it can help you, then mission successful. Um, what is the best lead source for commercial roofing? Oh, that, that kind of, come on. That's like asking for the silver bullet. I can, I can tell you, in my personal opinion, there has never been a lead source that has cultivated more opportunities than, than cold calling, telemarketing. Mm. Sales development reps who are picking up phones and making calls. And that's because most of the people that we're trying to get a hold of uh, yes, they're on LinkedIn, some of them, but your real private owner, facility manager, private owner, facility, building maintenance, um, they're blue collar. They're not sitting on LinkedIn. They're not jumping through all of that different stuff. They're running a business, right? They're making sure that whatever is happening there, the safety, the setup, all that kind of different stuff. Nothing in my experience has ever beat that. Um, you can follow all kinds of different trends. Um, there are different areas that you can sprinkle leads in. Talked about trade shows. Trade shows can bring 30, 40, 50 leads, but it all depends on what you guys do with those leads on if it truly has a return on investment. So again, it's unique to everybody. Uh, quantity doesn't always overpower quality. Um, I have one client who has some SEO and they say it's worth probably about 250 to 300,000 a year, um, but they spend 20,000 a year on it. I'd spend 20,000 for 300,000 every year, but it's not enough in a quantity side to grow their business any, any more than what they have. Does that make sense? It's kind of just a static one. I'm gonna say, keep doing it, but if you wanna grow the business, we gotta find somewhere else to get those leads. Okay. Um, all right, I think we're good. Let's switch gears and grab the screen. Yes, sir. And uh, we'll do two things. We'll do center point. We'll ask some questions and show specific reports. But then also, too, I'll share what the team's working on. I got some good stuff coming for you.